The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Team, ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago, and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team. And today I'm pumped to be here with Charlie Viola. Charlie's a partner and managing director at Pitcher Partners, where he's been since 2003. Uh, he became a partner there in 2005. And uh, he was just giving me the bit of the download that he joined that business to start the wealth management arm. And uh, it's probably a pretty fair comment to say it's it's grown pretty steadily since then. Uh, doing a bit of stalking in prep for this, I uh, see that it's grown from their their assets under management from fifty million dollars in two thousand and one to three billion dollars in twenty twenty two. So a staggering amount of growth. And uh, Charlie personally looks after uh, a bit over two billion dollars uh, in assets under management. Charlie, uh, well, I didn't have an. I, it's only a thirty minute podcast, so I can't list all of the accolades. But uh, he's been recognised in the Barons Top one hundred list for um, the last four years running one of the 50 most influential advisors in Australia for the last four years, uh, investment advisory, IFA awards, partner of the year, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, uh, Charlie, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me, Ben. Much appreciated, mate. I've been watching on on uh, this XY advisor stuff that you guys are doing and, yeah, it's always been great work and very interesting. So, yeah, delighted to be here, mate. Well, hearing that, I'm surprised you said yes to talk to me. If you'd probably be sick of my voice by now, I wouldn't imagine. But, uh Mate, is it true? A little birdie told me that because um, I think if you look at that growth, fifty million to three billion dollars, um, obviously staggering. But uh, is it true that it all started from the phone book? Yeah, it's exactly true. So whenever I tell this story, I was I actually did a um, a presentation once for industry, and, and literally the, the name of the presentation was from a from a desk and a phone book to this. Um, so yeah, when I when I got here, um, yeah, there was already there was already you know sort of a, a like a, a burgeoning business, uh, one advisor who was kind of doing everything, um, but really no infrastructure, no systems, no structure. Um, but more importantly, there were no clients. Um, so uh, after sort of crying myself to sleep every night for the first uh, couple of months and, you know, having no income and no clients, I thought, well, either I'm I'm no good at this and I'll go back to the bank where I was um, or I'll give it a crack. Um, and I remember sort of I talked to my dad at the time and he said, oh, and my dad was a, you know, orchard farmer, so orange and lemons. And he said to me, well, you can, you can come and pick oranges if you like. And I said, well, <laughs> fuck that. I'm not going to do that. Um, I, uh, I, I decided I'd give it a crack. So um, I realized that I needed to find centers of influence. Like I needed to find people who could actually send me work. So I literally sat down one day, uh, opened the yellow pages and it was online, but you know, open the yellow pages online um, and tried to work out, you know, who was who was it that would that would send me work. So I started ringing some accounting firms, and then um, I, I rang this guy from an outplacement agency. Um, you know, so uh, 
and what he did for a living was when executives were made redundant, um, he would bring them in, talk them through why they were leaving their existing job, what sort of job they wanted in the future, help them put together a kind of career plan going forward and, you know, help them work out if they're going to go do NED roles. Um, but he wasn't giving any investment advice or any kind of financial advice. Uh, and I sort of jumped on it and said, well, mate, any of these guys who kind of need advice around what to do with their redundancy payment or their super, and I don't know, we, we, we built rapport straight away. I think I was I was 22 or 23 years of age. Um, he was this really kind of flamboyant guy who he'd come from Melbourne and we were meeting in Sydney. And this meant nothing to me being from Sydney. Um, but he said to me, I really like you, Charlie, because you've got you've got more front than Maya, which uh, means nothing to somebody from Sydney. But, you know, you go to Melbourne, they've <laughs> obviously got the, the Burke Street Mall, which is this, this, this great big banner that's by Maya across. So anyway, um, we got on really well. He, he literally sent me one executive from one company uh, who I met, went through a process. That guy got a new job. Um, as part of his new job, uh, a reasonable part of his remuneration was share-based REM. Uh, I explained how the share-based REM worked, and um, but I have very few skills in life, but very few, but uh, making complex things seem simple is, is maybe one of them, um, which is probably an okay skill to have in, in, uh, in our world. So, so he, he he said to me, well, mate, that was really simple. Why don't you come along and explain it to the, the whole of the executive team, which I did. Uh, I trundled it off and, and uh, provided uh, a whole bunch of Macquarie bankers um, an explanation as to how their share-based REM scheme worked. Uh, it resonated with a few of them. Uh, a number of them then um, came and saw me as individuals. A couple of those guys then went off to other organisations where they got me involved and then the HR manager from from one of those organisations went to another one. And after sort of uh, about 18 months or two years, it happened pretty quickly, I had four or five listed companies where I was getting paid a consulting fee to come in and explain how the share-based REM works. So, you know, um, when they when they get stock, when they're allowed to sell it, what their minimum holding requirements are, how the taxing works, um, how to fit it into your broader portfolio. So I was basically getting paid to virtually market to these executives. Um, and, you know, I just ended up building this kind of really good cohort of kind of C-suite, kind of mid-40s to um, early 50s kind of clients uh, with, a, with a great capacity to, to, to earn money. And, you kind of fast forward, um, those clients which I've still got now um, are much wealthier. You know, the guy that had two millions now got 15 or 20 kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, it allowed us to kind of transform the business from being very much a kind of financial planning or an advisory business into an investment business because that's what's important to those people now. Yeah, and t- talk to me a little bit more about that because you did mention when we were chatting just before we, we fired up the recording, but um, how did that come to pass and then what did it actually look like practically inside your business? So we when I, when I started the business or, or when the business started, we were very much a retail financial planning business, you know, and we were doing all the things that, you know, kind of retail financial planners do. You know, you'd go through a process of getting a fact find and do the SOA and, you know, you'd, you'd kind of try and marry the client before you'd even met them um, where you, you know, you got every bit of detail and then you tried to kind of model things out over a really long period of time. Um, and that was always sort of fine in terms of onboarding onboarding the clients. And it was a really important part of, you know, building rapport and getting to know the clients and onboarding them. But what we worked out over time is that as the business grew and as your relationship with the client grew over time, because you'd already done the process of getting all the right money into all the right buckets, it very much became that the enduring value add and the thing that they were most interested in was actually producing good investment returns. So we started to spend more and more time just talking about the investment piece, about asset allocation, about diversity, about uh, different types of investments and generating your return in different ways. As the average client went from, you know, sort of one or two mil of investable monies to kind of 10 or 15 or 20 mil of investable monies, uh, you know, there wasn't, there's not like tax systems in Australia are really very simple. There's only four, four, four tax buckets that you can kind of put money in, you know, um, personal company trust or super. So the planning piece in reality is really simple, especially for high net wealth people. The higher net wealth somebody is, the easier the planning is, you know, just make sure you fill up the super bucket and then really you've only got the three other buckets that you that you use. It's reasonably simple. So really the enduring value add 
over time was making sure that the underlying assets were generating a good return and generating a return that that we were be able to produce a better return that they can do themselves uh, and giving them access to product and and opportunities and deal flow that they otherwise couldn't see. So just over time, as the clients got bigger, we realised that these clients will be stickier and they will love us more if we work really hard on making sure that we're protecting their capital, we're generating revenue for them, we're controlling the impairment risk within the within the portfolio, and we're producing good outsized investment outcomes, you know, over a really long period of time. If all of your and you know, then then just we sort of sprinkle that with the life advice as time goes on. And, you know, um, kids getting married, wanting to lend money to kids and protect it, um, you know, divorces, new cars, um, you know, whatever. But the, but the overriding and enduring service was making sure the monies were well invested. So we just ended up spending more and more time worrying about how, you know, how we access investments, how we deal with it, you know, how we put portfolios together, how we manage risk. So, um, and it, it sort of, it kind of needed the business to get to like a, almost a critical mass point for that to occur because, um, you know, if all you're doing is running around trying to find new clients every day, then you're doing lots of the upfront planning. But as the business got bigger, it became much more about the clients we have and the investments we can hold, if that makes sense. Yes, and how did you build that that skill from coming in? Obviously, you know, as a planner, you've got the strategy piece, as you say, and then fast forward to today where you are, um, you know, managing like significantly more money, much bigger clients. How did how did you and you you guys as a business go about building out that offering and that muscle over time, or and particularly in the early days? Yeah, so um, I think firstly, I'm really fortunate that my business partner here, uh, the guy that I kind of started the business with, Martin, he, he's our CIO. So he's excellent from an investment perspective. Um, you know, he's quietly spoken. Uh, he doesn't sort of sing and dance very much, but his ability to kind of, um, you know, do the screens, do the call and quant uh, and do the, the review of the assets has always been a really strong point. That's been a really strong point of our business over time. Um, in lots of ways, though, you learn on these, you, you learn in the university of life, like you learn by osmosis. So um, one of the things that I've always done, and I still do today, um, you, you can imagine, and Ben, you'd be the same, the, the number of fund managers and guys running their own money and, you know, private capital guys who want to come and talk to you because they see you as part of their distribution network. Um, I, I kind of almost never say no to those things because I find myself, I find an ability to learn things from those people I then need to then apply that to the client situation or the underlying portfolios that I have. But but I would say that um, I just love having the conversation. You know, I'm an investment guy at heart, I guess. Uh, and I've just learned over time by osmosis, you know, uh, understanding how um, how risk assets work, you know, what, what drives them, you know, what the liquidity risk is, what the line of sight um, to money coming back is. Um, so it, it is something that I think, kind of developed over time you know i i would have said back in 2003 when i started flicking through the phone book that i'm a strategy guy um now today i'm absolutely an investment guy because of because the strategy stuff is actually really simple so mm. um and, and the investment stuff is where we can genuinely add value to clients yeah it's interesting i um in my business have started Deal, well, we started a while ago, but dealing with clients that have got more and more money, and as you say, that the strategic piece it is complex, and certainly in the in the early stages in getting it all structured, that there is a, a lot that goes into that. But once you do get things up and running, that there is a level of simplicity that's there uh, around that. So it does make a lot of sense, Charlie. What would you say? What have been the the what's been the biggest challenge or the biggest challenges on on your journey at Pitcher? Uh, the biggest challenges I, I would say are were probably systems. To be honest, I think we grew quicker than our systems. Um, so back in back in two thousand and three, when I got here, um, you know, we we kind of had VisiPlan. Uh, we then turned VisiPlan into XPlan. Um, you know, and so uh, we you know we were cutting edge for about five minutes. Um, the uh, we are uh, we, we're a completely bespoke 
business, which means that we're off platform uh, in the main. So of our sort of 3.2 or 3.3 bill of capital that we have here, we've probably only got four or $500 million on, on platform. The rest of it we hold directly. Um, so, you know, come 2011, um, when we had this 2005 cutting edge business, we really started to struggle in terms of um, how we would report, how we would produce tax reporting to clients. Um, the uh, And then, you know, and while we continue to kind of create greater efficiencies and, and it was really us just kind of, you know, kind of sewing a spreadsheet to X plan and then X plan to another system and then another spreadsheet to another spreadsheet. And, and the client outcomes were all about the investment outcomes. So the clients didn't care, but we just didn't have the same functionality as other groups had and we just didn't have the same systems. Um in about 2017, uh, we made, you know, a decision to go out and get, you know, a GM and a um, and a head of ops. And we just, you know, we spent a bucket load of money uh, trying to drag the business into kind of the 21st century. Um, and, you know, I'm pleased to say now that, that you know, we've got absolute kind of leading systems. We've got great client portals. We've got great tax systems for clients to be able to pull their, their stuff out. But there was, a, there was a real period in the middle there where, you know, we had – I think we had at one stage like 11 people doing nothing but ticking and flicking X plan. And when I say ticking and flicking, you know, you'd have the client's bank statement, you'd have all their dividend statements, you'd have their, you know, holding statements for whatever unit trusts or private investments, and then making sure it kind of married to what was on X plan, which the clients could see and would, would drive our investment reporting. So we had this raft of people doing kind of um, manual data entry. Um, and it was always this real pain point in the business that, um, you know, that, that it, we just weren't efficient. We've now got, we've literally now got two people and the business is kind of twice the size. Uh, so yeah. the system stuff was a real challenge. Um, the, I think the other, the other challenge in fairness from a business perspective is Martin and I uh, started here, you know, Martin in sort of 2002, me in 2003. So there were two of us, even still today, there are only four of us. Um, finding really good advisors that are, um, you know, have the investment capability, have got the kind kind of client service ethic that we want. And, you know, I have a bit of a saying in here and it's kind of written up on the walls, do the right thing by the client, the rest will follow. We've probably had a little bit of an industry where some mm. people in our industry are a bit kind of overpaid and under smart. So, you know, we probably struggled to sort of grow beyond the, the sort of four main advisors that we have here and, you know, we actively look, and um, but it's uh, it's difficult in our world. You know, the, uh, the, the the bigger players, Coda, Crestone, Scala, um, you know, Credit Suisse, um, you know, they, they 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 you know they pay more than what uh, than what we do, um, and we found that we found that growth trajectory um, sort of difficult over a period of time, um, right. but you know. It does sort of mean, though, that we can continue to provide these really kind of bespoke, high-value services and not commoditize it too much. So it's kind of wins and losses in all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We, I'm um, happy to report for anyone that's been following along uh, for the last little while that we've been hiring for advisors for the last year, basically. And in that time, we brought on two new advisors into the business and it's been so frustrating. Um, and I'm sort of, you think about it, and particularly like in the in the earlier parts of that year, and I'm sort of thinking like it can't be that hard because there's 15,000 advisors out there, like yeah. we're in good business, it's a good opportunity. But when you start going, well, you need someone that's the right culture fit for the business, the right experience set, the right work ethic, the, the someone that wants to grow or like in our case grow or in some cases not grow, like you just start narrowing it down. And the more I thought about it, I realised that, actually like it, you and your business is very different to ours like the advisors that would be suitable for us wouldn't be suitable for you the advisors that would be suitable for you probably wouldn't be suitable for us and vice versa as well so then on top of that good, you got good, the good advisors, yeah good, good advisors have already got good jobs and and that's part that's partly the problem and um mm -hmm. the advisors maybe you don't want you don't have jobs you don't want sort of thing so <laughs> um the uh like, like we hold the client piece really close to our heart here you know you, you, the, the reality is is that you know we're a fee for service business um if the client doesn't pay their pay their invoice you know we don't eat kind of thing so um you know protecting 
both the culture of the business, which, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to build up and, you know, we've got a really long tenure in our business. You know, we've got people who have been here with us for 15 and 16 years. And I think our average tenure here is about 10 or 11 years or something. So it's quite long. So we probably feel like a nice place to work. Um, we, we hold that close to our heart. But the client-centric piece, you know, it's, it's, it's really important that you find people who absolutely have the best interests of their clients um, at heart and are willing to kind of build over a period of time because we are fee-for-service. We don't charge for the initial proposal. We don't charge for the original advice piece. Um, we take that as acquisition cost because we're trying to build long-term, we're trying to build long-term enduring relationships with clients because even from an enterprise value point of view of our business, um, the more recurring revenue we have, uh, the, 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 the more valuable this business will be. Um, and these are great businesses to run, right? Because you've got this scenario where you've got less people doing it. You've got people getting, you've got people getting um, richer and richer uh, all, all the time, which means you kind of have this kind of asymmetric piece where um, as a result, there's more, there's more wealthy people for less of us who are doing a good job sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, it's it's exciting, and I, I think it's that's playing across a lot of markets in financial advice. That um, less less advisors advice advice consumers more in basically every market segment, and then yeah, everyone's sort of getting richer. So, in my view, yeah. I think the next little while is a great time to 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 be in advice. Um, and there was got there was a heap of there was like this massive kerfuffle, you know, post royal commission about you know education standards and having to do the phase year exam and all of those sorts of things. Which, like, I really get if you're fifty five and really experienced and good to your clients that you kind of don't want to have to go through those things. Mm. But what we've seen as a result of those of those things is the people now coming to the industry um, are much better are much better educated they see it as a professional service they don't see it as a sales process so while that process that we went through with you know phasia and code of conduct and um, you know the royal commission and whatever was challenging and difficult and there was a heap of upheaval and stuff about it um, the reality is the outcome of it and the consequence of it has actually meant that you've actually got better people who are up want to be part of the industry they see it as a professional service they see it as a long-term career they see it as mm. uh, you know something that they can kind of do over a really long period of time so um you know i think in some ways and whether they expected this to occur while it's a bit like turning the big tanker around it takes a while to turn around you can actually see mm. the value of it now turning around because people are now coming in having done stuff at university, they're coming in and they're happy to be patient to learn about, you know, how to deal with clients. They're not wanting to come in and and clip the ticket immediately. So those things, as a as a sort of forty three year old, some of those things were even challenging for me. I sort of wanted to tell people to bugger off when they said I had to go back and do other education. I've been doing this for twenty four years. Um, yes. but I now really see the value in that the young people that are coming through the industry are just better than what they ever were. Mm, totally. Yeah, I, I think that there's definitely people negatively impacted that probably shouldn't have been and overall not perfect. But like you say, that, that now new advisors that you have to be you have to be pretty committed to become a financial advisor because it's you need the qualifications, you need to do the PY, you need to do all of those things. And I think that's got to be good for advice. It's hard to imagine yeah. how, how it could, could not be. And then I think at the same time, and again, the, the legislation not perfect, but some of those changes and the the emphasis on, you know, best interest duty, breach reporting, like all of these things, it's really putting the magnesco- uh, magnifying glass on advice, and it has uplifted the um, the the quality, the the clarity, the transparency. Again, still not perfect, but I think all of those things they combine to consumers start getting better advice outcomes, and they start telling their mates more, and then more people start getting yeah. advice, and it's just. Uh, uh, it keeps feeding the cycle. So, yeah, definitely yeah, not look, it, the right direction. And, and you know, we, we talk about this all the time. Even, you know, we're talking about REM structures and stuff in here at the moment for our advisors. Like anything that creates the right behaviours is the right answer. So all that stuff around, mm. you know, the regulatory, like some of it is some of it is maybe a little bit painful, but it's all about creating the right behaviours. And the better that you mm. make those behaviours and the more innate you make those behaviours o- over time, the better it is for, for, for all of us. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Absolutely. Charlie, what would you say, what's been the most difficult skill that you'd have to master to, that you've had to master to be the advisor you are today? Like I, like I think I'm, um, 
You don't it's, know. Not meeting, um, it's not writing meeting minutes, is it? Don't say meeting minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the admin is painful for everybody, but um, I, I actually get therapy out of doing the admin because it reminds me, you know, <laughs> what conversations I've had and all of those sorts of things. Like nobody wants to do it. Um, look, I, I think that I think that to be honest, I think that the most difficult thing uh, over time has been uh, the delegation piece um, and telling and telling clients that they're not right for you um you've only got so many hours in the day and you know i wear two hats in this business i'm it's on the md as well as obviously um you know probably it's key advisor i think the biggest difficulty has been telling clients who you know you have a conversation with you you they automatically you know you, you both automatically kind of fall in love and then you realize realize from a commercial perspective that that client maybe isn't right for you or your business or um you know mm-hmm. and, and so i think that for me is that that for me is still super challenging um you know i've got a reasonable number of clients that i that i look after uh telling clients that they need to see somebody else and even existing clients when i'm sort of pushing it down to a couple of the associates and stuff i find the the kind of breaking up stuff really really hard to be honest um because you, you have real relationships with these people you know you know um you know you know their kids names you know their dogs names they tell you when the dogs died like like you, you have real relationships with these people so um i i find that piece really challenging and something that i'm not actually very good at to be honest and, and even you know our stakeholders and our shareholders are always saying to me you know the key person risk in this business is unacceptable um because of the level of you know the fact i run it the level of fun that i carry and the amount of fees that i do um and they say you know we want you to give 40 of your clients to the two young associates that you've been you know sort of grooming and bringing through but that's really hard to do like that that's like that's <laughs> genuinely difficult to do mm. yeah it's not i don't think that transition is easy uh it, no matter what your business is and i think you you build relationship you build trust you build comfort people understand that and as much as what we do is you know it's numerical and it's objective and it's um uh, yeah, there, there is that, but it's um, people get used to that comfort. And I think a big part of people getting great results from their money is taking action, having confidence to do that, though, is, is a barrier. And I think that that relationship helps to build the confidence, even though the advice might be the same, no matter who's um, saying it. Yeah, trust is real. Like trust, trust is a real emotion, uh, and it's a real. You know, tr- trust is a is a big determinant in decision making. Um, so, like, because you can you can pass on the client, you can you know that they can serve the client exactly the way that you do, um, but you can't pass that trust on. Do you know what I mean? So, um, I found that I found that challenging. Um, you know, and like I say, the other piece that's been challenging recently is finding good advisors in the market. If I'm honest, yeah. No doubt. Well, look, when you crack the code on that first one, just uh, if you could let me know, that would be appreciated. <laughs> um, Charlie, what what are you guys focused on now? What's coming up for you? We probably be, believe we've built, you know, we've got a really good business now. Uh, we've got great resources in terms of, you know, our efficiency and the manner in which we kind of produce documents and produce outcomes for clients. You know, we're one way, same way. We've got great online portals for clients to, to utilise. We've got live data all of the time. Um, you know, our ability to kind of produce our sort of wholesale proposal documents and our review documents and what have you, we think is absolute market leading. We've got great access to product. Um, you know, we're, we're really big in, uh, the private asset space. You know, we get great access to, to really good, interesting things that kind of fit in client portfolios. So we believe that, you know, and we've built sort of a good brand around that sort of stuff. So we believe that we're a great business. What's next for us really is, is to continue to grow, you know, um, um, if you look at the real, you know, if you look at the kind of relative success of, you know, a business like Coda, complete standing start sort of three or four years ago to 10 bill of assets under advice and 30 advisors in three years, you know, their, their ability to scale quickly um, was sort of phenomenal. And while they, you know, while I'm sure that of the 28 advisors, they've had 15 that have left, um, we never wanted to make a mistake, right? Um, you know, for us now, it's it's about trying to work out how we actually get to that scale. It's about how we use the systems, the process, the brand, the opportunity from an investment perspective that we've got for clients and really start to to scale that and start to, to grow that. Um, uh, and, and, you know, again, we really want to take that growth mindset 
from because we believe that we can add value and we sort of believe you know you know i'm a sort of passionate believer of private wealth i, I believe that we add value over time i believe we can kind of generate really good client outcomes um we just want kind of people to come in and come on the journey with us kind of thing because like it's fun like you, you get a, a heap of intellectual stimuli about talking to wealthy clients about their money um it's the, they're fun things to do and most of us in this world are kind of well paid to do it so um like kind of who wouldn't want to work in these kind of these businesses in this industry yeah totally yeah, it's interesting clients they're doing interesting things and then when you look at the strategies and what you choose to do then that's all pretty interesting uh, as well so i certainly yeah. see the appeal charlie my last question for you is that if you could go back and do one thing differently what would it be Oh, we would have we would have fixed systems earlier. So I, I think we lost three or four years of of you know growth um, by you know having to reconcile things on spreadsheets and tick and flick things and um, you know systems systems are really important um, uh, and really help from an efficiency point of view and add to your service offering fairly significantly and give you time back in the day. So um, when we had our you know. 2005 cutting edge business in 2012 um, i wish we hadn't have waited until kind of 2015 to kind of you know start the process of kind of fixing those things um with an assumption of kind of she'll be right um so you know we would have made sure that the underlying infrastructure and all those things were better and like i said we still produce good outcomes and at the end of the day it was about investment outcomes but it was hard work for a really long period of time. So, but outside of that, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm really pleased with the journey that we've been on. You know, we've been really fortunate with the client sort of cohort that we've been able to attract to our business. You know, I'm, I'm um, we've worked really hard to be in the market looking for really good investment opportunities um, for clients, and we think we add value around uh, we add real value around uh, all of that stuff. So, um, so yeah, there's not heaps that we would that that I would change, but yeah, having some better systems, uh, I think, is certainly one. I think the best time to fix your systems is always five years ago, but uh, yeah, yeah, time yeah. now, and yep. I think it's the biggest frustration for a lot of advisors. There's so many moving parts that it still yep. blows my mind that there isn't uh, a system that could work. But I suppose that like could work across all businesses that integrates the different things that you need. But uh, yep. you know, here here we are. Yep. So. change is hard too like like if you if you continue to do something the same way for a long period of time and it notionally works because clients don't leave and you're you know you're getting on more clients change is hard it's that old um that old sort of saying where um i'm happy to change as long as it doesn't affect me um and you know, we <laughs> did that for we did that for a really long period of time like where we went yeah i'm happy to change but i don't want to change what i do every day kind of thing like yeah and, and then it just got to the point where oh shit you really have to change now um or you know we're just gonna we're just gonna stop adding value to clients because we're gonna spend way too much time doing all of this other rubbish yeah it definitely helps but it's an investment to get there for sure uh, but Charlie, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, great to see you uh, kicking those goals, mates. I, I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Ben. Much appreciated, mate. And yeah, uh, delighted to have been on. <laughs>